Well, I hope you all are appreciating as much as I am the uh, sermon series that we're in the midst of right now. Doyd is inviting us as we enter this new age of artificial intelligence to engage the always critical topic of what it means to be a human. What does it mean to be a human being? And I guess, um, interestingly enough, uh, ma matter of synchronicity, uh, that's really at the, at the heart of Paul's uh, uh, work. That's what he's interested in, too, is what does it mean to be a human being? So I'll, I'll, I'll spend a minute recapping where we've been the last two times we were together here. <clears throat> but to do that, before I do that, I want to go back to the beginning, the beginning of, of, of our uh, journey as, as the people of God. In Genesis 1, uh, that, that, the, that magisterial sovereign God who uh, in the first chapter of Genesis uh, is reported to have created the heavens and the earth. And after each day of creation, what does he say? You remember? He looks down on, on what he's accomplished that day, and what does God say? And it was good. <clears throat> and, and then towards the end, God creates the human beings. He's made, we're told the human beings are made in his own image, and what does he say? It was very good. Okay. So right at the right from the from the beginning of scripture, and he doesn't say, Oh, a few of you are very good, or you're very good and, and you're not. You are very good. All, all human beings are very good. And then the second great uh, um, uh, creation story in the third chapter of Genesis, Adam and Eve, remember we talked about this last time, love this story. It's, it's a beautiful story about, about what it means to be human. God has, has uh, put the people, uh, put Adam and Eve, he's raised them up, he's put them in paradise. And he said, Everything here is yours, but there's one thing I want to uh, warn you about. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, what's the first thing they did, right? The, the, the snake, the wily snake, the wily serpent comes to Eve and says, look, don't pay any attention to that. You can eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because then you will be like God, right? Then you will be like God, meaning that you human beings will get to decide who's good and who's bad. You human beings will get to decide what's good and what's evil. You human beings will move God out of the judgment seat and take God's place in the judgment seat. So I really like to think of this, this story, the, this, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as really being the tree of self-importance. Right? It's the tree of self-importance because who, who takes God's place? We do. Our egos become the center of the universe. Right? We're the ones who get to, to, to make all the decisions. Now, uh, uh, fast forward. Okay? Paul is, uh, uh, is a Pharisee. He's a student of the Bible. He's a member of the temple police. And anytime a religion needs a police force, you know you're in trouble, right? So Paul's a member of the temple police. He's a Pharisee. He gets to decide who's good and who's bad. He gets to decide what's, what's right and what's wrong. He gets to decide what's good and what's evil. And so Saul, Saul of Tarsus, sets out, we're told one day, to head to Damascus. And what, what's he going to do in Damascus? Well, we're told he's breathing threats and murder. And he's going to bring some of these people who are following the way, this, this, this new uh, path in Judaism called the way, he's going to bring them back to, uh, to Jerusalem to stand trial. And what happens to him on this road to Damascus? He has a vision, a remarkable vision. Uh, the, the light bursts around him, and he hears a voice. And he realizes that this voice is the risen Christ. And the risen Christ says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And now that's a little strange because Saul's never met Jesus. You know, Jesus was, was crucified and the resurrection happened um, outside of Saul's presence. He's never met Jesus. And so you, you can imagine him saying to yourself, hey, man, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting your followers but I'm not persecuting you. 
So he, he, his, his friends take him off to Damascus and he spends three days uh, recovering from this amazing epiphany. And during the course of those three days, he has a, an incredible realization. And that realization is what we're gonna spend um, a good bit of our time talking about uh, in just a few minutes. This realization that the risen Christ is the is the the, the cosmic vision for all of humanity. Um, Jesus is the archetypal human being. There's a bodily identification between Jesus and humanity. That's what we mean by the cosmic Christ. And Christ, you know, the Jesus of Nazareth, the human Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth put to death, three days in the tomb. Resurrection happens, and the risen Christ now becomes apparent. Christ, you know, remember we said last week or two weeks ago, Christ is not Jesus's last name, right? Christ means the anointed one. So now this archetypal human being becomes known to Paul and becomes known to all of humanity as the anointed one. Okay, so what, what, are, what are the implications from this? And Paul's going to spend the rest of his life working out the implications of this, uh, his, his vision of this archetypal human being uh, who uh, is, is revealing God's nature uh, to Paul. And, and in turn, Paul's going to reveal to uh, the rest of us what it means to be a human being, given all of this. So you remember we talked about um, Paul is, is often thought to be a kind of a blue-nosed Puritan, right? He's got a lot of rules for everybody and wants everybody to sort of toe the mark. Well, that's not Paul at all. In fact, Paul transcends that vision. And, and you, you recall we talked about Paul's notion of sin, okay? Sin, for Paul, is not a legalistic juridical concept. It's not about individual misbehavior, okay? It's that, that kind of individual misbehavior that we're all familiar with, at least I'm familiar with it, uh, and, and certainly Paul is familiar with it, and, you know, he'll give us these laundry lists of, of uh, things he, he would prefer that we didn't do. Those are all symptoms of sin. You know, that's not, that's not the sin itself. The sin is, let's, let's go back to the Adam and Eve story. The, the, the sin, the, the besetting sin, is that we have substituted our own judgment, we've substituted our own egos, we've substituted our, our own notion of what's good and what's bad, what's right and who's wrong, and, and what's wrong for God. So that's this dualistic thinking, right, where, uh, like, like Paul, breathing threats and murder, Saul of Tarsus, breathing threats and murder, you know, he's, he's a dualistic thinker. And he's had this vision that makes him uh, understand that there's something that transcends that dualistic thinking. So, so Paul then uh, spends a good bit of time talking about dying to sin. We die to sin, meaning we die to the rule of the ego. We die to we're enslaved to our egos, my dear friends. I mean, just think about it. We're enslaved to our egos. And Paul understands that and, and calls that the flesh. Whenever you hear Paul talking about the flesh, uh, he's talking about that enslavement uh, to the ego. And, and Doit was, was um, talking about that uh, in his sermon this morning. He, did, he didn't call it the, the flesh, but that's, that's, that's what Paul would call it. Our, our enslavement to our compulsions, right? Our enslavement to, uh, to uh, what our, what our, remember Doit was talking about, our bodily uh, desires, our bodily demands. You know, that's the flesh. And Paul contrasts that, uh, that, that flesh, that ego-driven behavior with the spirit. And the spirit is the true self. The spirit is, it's, how you know who you are after you've met God. That for Paul is, is the spirit. And it's the spirit which allows us to experience our true selves. This ego-driven behavior that Paul uh, considers sin is a false self. You know, we create these false selves uh, for, as, as defenses. Right? There, there are three, again, from, from last time, there, there are really three primal human urges. The, the, the urge for power and control, safety and security, and affection and esteem. 
And we create these false selves in order to secure those for us. You know, we've, and we've each got our own version of that, mind's affection and esteem, right? And, and, we, and, and so we, we yearn, we long for those things and, and, and we create the false self, not knowing yet that the true self, the God-given self, the indwelling Christ, as, as Paul will, will call it, the true self knows that we already have all of that. That, 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 so, so all our behavior that's, that's stimulated by our ego defenses is, is completely unnecessary. So Paul says, for example, in his letter to the Galatians, those of you who are following along, chapter 5 in Galatians, and I'm going to read now the translation by Eugene Peterson, the modern um, uh, pastor who I think is so great, and I, I encourage you all, if you don't have the message, to, to go out and get it, if you, if you love the Bible. In Galatians 5, Paul says, my counsel is this, live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. You hear that? The compulsions of selfishness. Where there's a root of sinful self-interest in, in us that is at odds with the free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are contrary to each other so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? So living by the Spirit, interestingly enough, ironically enough, frees us from what he calls domination by the law. Now, what, what's the law? The law, recall, is, is uh, in scriptures that which was given uh, to, to Moses by God on Mount Sinai, and the people have uh, tried to live in accordance with the law. And, and that's great. The law is, 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 a, is a good thing. But remember, we, we said that the law, while it's a good thing, the law is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient for salvation. And we spend so much time we waste so much time thinking, oh, if only I do good, if only I behave myself, if only I follow the law, then I'll be saved, right? Remember, remember the image, and, and, and we project that onto God, okay? And, and you, you may recall the, 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 the images of the critical mother and the critical father that I think we, we often uh, fall prey to. The critical mother says, do this and do that, and then I'll love you. And the critical father says, follow the rules or get out. Right? That's, we project those images onto God. But, but Paul reminds us that that, that puts us in an, in an impossible bind. And he, said, he says this so beautifully in, in, in Romans chapter 7. He expresses the human bind uh, this way. I can anticipate the response that's coming. This is Peterson again from the message. I know that all of God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What sin's prison is the, is the prison that the ego, our ego-driven compulsions create for us. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, sure. Um, so if I can't be trusted to figure out what's best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. That's the bind we're in. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. Then he goes on and on and, and you know, describes this, this dilemma in, in different ways, and then he concludes like this. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. 
He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions, for I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. So it's, it's that, that risen Christ who offers us this way out of the, of, the, of the bind that we find ourselves in. Um, okay, so, so Paul reminds us that the law can't overcome the flesh, that, that we need to transcend the law. And, and one, one thing that that leads us to, to consider is how many of us have spent a good part of our lives engaged in a worthiness contest? Right? Yeah. But here's, here's Paul's brilliant insight is, you know what? We are all unworthy. Worthiness is irrelevant to God. Because go, go back to the, the, the creation stories again. God created us in God's own image, and we are very good. You know, not just you and not just you, but all of us. We are very good. So um, I, I, I love this. This is from something Father Richard Rohr said once that I just I just really love. He said the the formula that most of us operate under is that if I do good, God will love me. And 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 Paul's formula is is in many ways turns that on its head. God loves me so that I can do good. Right? It's the our 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 morals our, our behavior is the fruit of recognizing that we are God's beloved, that this is who, who we are from, from the, the moment of our birth, God's beloved. And so when, when we accept the, 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 the true self, when we recognize the true self, then, then, then we're able to live into the freedom that God calls us to. And for Paul, freedom, it, it, not following the rules, but freedom is, is what Paul says that uh, God has designed for us. It, again, in Galatians, Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set you free. Isn't that wonderful? For freedom, Christ has set you free. And then from, once again, from Galatians, and I think this is just the, this is the money quote of the day, okay? Paul says, now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. See, we needed the law until we, we were spiritually mature enough to, to live into faith. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. And remember, remember for Paul, justification by faith really means surrender. We're, we're, we're all unworthy. We all make mistakes. We all screw up. And when we surrender to our true selves, when we surrender to what Paul will call the indwelling Christ or the, or the hidden Christ, or he says, we're, you've been clothed with Christ. When we surrender to that, then we understand our true selves. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You see these mystical visions that, that he has? I mean, I, remember I told you a couple of weeks ago, he, he uses the term uh, en Christo, in Christ. This is all, you know, the same thing, clothed with Christ, indwelling Christ, over 140 times in his letters. Right. So it's Christ is here. So what, again, I'm so it's so wonderful that Doyd is uh, leading us in these uh, uh, these explorations uh, in these four weeks. That's what he was talking about uh, today. When we was talking about soul, right? That's the that's the indwelling Christ. When we when we're in, in touch with that soul, uh, we're in touch with the Christ who lives within us. Um. Now, here's, here's uh, uh, Paul's conclusion from that. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, 
then you were Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean, it, right? That's the heart of Paul's uh, word for us. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. That's a word of liberation, my friends. That's a word of liberation, of freedom. So, you know, in this age, I mean, my God, it was, it was, it was awful before lockdown, but it's worse now. The divisiveness, the tribalism, the I'm right and you're wrong. You know, we don't even want to talk to each other anymore, right? That's, that, that's, that's all a function of this ego-driven need to make ourselves uh, God, to put ourselves in the judgment seat. And it's just getting worse and worse. And I think, my goodness, the, the, the advent of, of uh, artificial intelligence, you know, it really has the, <laughs> I'm, I'm, with the, 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 the prayer that, that, that Doyd offered us a little while ago that, you know, maybe this is just a false flag and it won't happen. I don't know. Yeah, so, so there were, you know, that's, that's, that's where we are. So morality is not Paul's concern. Freedom is his concern. But what does freedom mean? It doesn't mean freedom to, you know, just do this or that, do whatever we want to do. I mean, this, the sort of individualistic notions that we, that we associate with freedom these days are, are just, it's just another way of talking about uh, the sin and the flesh. Yeah. That's, that's all that this, this atomistic individualism that's, that's uh, become at the heart of Western culture, it seems, in the last 200 years is, is really a, a deeply false promise. And Paul, so for, for freedom, Paul says, Christ has set you free. Do you all know, I know you do, because, because you all uh, uh, pray the, the morning office uh, at, at Epiphany often. I, I love the collect for peace. Oh, God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. To serve you is perfect freedom. Think about that. Offering yourself to Christ. Offering yourself, surrendering yourself is perfect freedom. Um, so freedom for Paul is conformity to that inner pattern of, of, of the indwelling Christ, conformity to the true self. But here's a, the church is afraid of freedom. Right? Not epiphany. But for 2,000 years, the church has been afraid of freedom. Because why? Because the church thinks it's in the business of control. Freedom scares the church. Because it means that, that you know, you, you can't be controlled. By the way, do you know where, you know where authority lies in the church? In the Roman Catholic Church with the Pope. In the Protestant church, it's in the Bible. In the Episcopal church, it's the former rector. All authority rests with the former rector. Am I right? Because <laughs> Doyle's been here long enough that, that the former rector, <laughs> that, that voice has been lost. <laughs> right. But to, to see, the, the, the the church is afraid people will make mistakes if, they get, if they're given too much freedom. But Paul understands that, that uh, freedom is what sets us free from the ego. The justification by faith is what sets us free from the ego. And uh, so, so grace isn't earned. It's not deserved. It's just part of God's gracious gift to us. Okay. Now, let me see how much time I've got. I'm, I'm trying to leave some time for questions. Um, now, we, now we're going to come to the, the last piece I want to share with you. And that is Paul's corporate vision. Paul's corporate, Paul's corporate vision for the body of Christ. Remember I said that, that uh, uh, Saul was puzzled when Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And, and the insight that he gets from that is that this cosmic Christ, this, this uh, uh, 
archetypal human being is a representation of all of humanity. And so if, if, if the cosmic Christ is a representation of all of humanity, it, it, it means that we are invited to participate in something that is larger than ourselves. So Christ reveals this cosmic universal pattern that we are invited to participate in. And I want to just, that, 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 that verb is so important, participation. We're invited to participate in this living body. So, uh, and you, you all are familiar, you've heard it a hundred times, the body of Christ, right? We talk about ourselves as being the body of Christ. What's that mean? What does that really mean? And why is that so important to Paul, who has this corporate communitarian vision? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that, uh, therefore, I want you to understand what he's about to say. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are a variety of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, etc., etc., etc. Paul outlines all the spiritual gifts, and, and he says... And every one of them is different. And every person has different spiritual gifts. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to, to each one individually just as the spirit chooses. Now, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So we're all, by, by, by virtue of baptism, and, and for Paul, you know, for Paul, baptism is, is, is something really important. I haven't spent much time on it, but let me, let me just, this, this is a, this is a year-long track <laughs> that I'm trying to squeeze into three sessions, so just bear with me. So baptism for Paul it is, is, is symbolic of the Paschal mystery. And the, what is the Paschal mystery? The dying and the rising, the, 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 the crucifixion and the resurrection. And, and in baptism, you know, we, we, go, we go down into the water. The old Adam, Paul says, goes down into the water. The old Adam dies. The old Adam dies to sin. And then what emerges on the other side is the new Adam. The, 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 the resurrected Adam, the new, the new person, the new human. So you see how that, that the baptism is, is, uh, is representative of, of this great Paschal mystery, the dying and the rising. Christ has died. Christ is, um, um, thank you, you know what I mean. Uh, right? Christ will come again. That, right? That's the Paschal mystery. We say, it, we say it all the time. Okay. So that's, what, that's, that's why baptism is important for Paul. Not because it's because there's a club that 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 if you don't belong to the club you're you're out of luck right he's just he's just using the, the that that symbolism of of uh, of death to sin and then rising again and then he goes on to say indeed the body does not consist of one member but of many if the foot were to say because i'm not a hand i do not belong to the body that would not make it any less a part of the body and if the ear were to, were to say because i'm not an eye i do not belong to the body that would not make it any less a part of the body if the whole body were an eye where would the hearing be if the whole body were were hearing where would the sense of smell be but as it is god arranged the members in the body so that members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. Yeah, I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. 
If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. And isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful image? You know, we don't have to be the same, and we can't all be the same. And, and you know, when our back, back to this, this parlous situation we find ourselves in in our culture these days, you know, those, those people who you don't agree with and who don't agree with you, you nevertheless need them. And they need you because they're all part of the one body. And so the, the ones we want to reject, the ones we want to um, um, carve out of the, uh, of, of the herd and say, you don't belong. Paul says, oh, no, they're, they're the ones who, who we have to pay most attention to. It's, it's, really, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Because by God, our egos want to, want to say, no, I, I know what's right and what's wrong, and I'm right and you're wrong. But if that's not Paul's vision. Um, and and he, so, so he goes on to say, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And then he gives this list of, of you know, people who do stuff in the church, apostles and teachers, and you know, you've all heard, heard all of that. But he says, <clears throat> he says, strive for the greater gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. That's the end of chapter 11. In First Corinthians, now l- let me let me stop and remind you <clears throat> that that the Paul's letter, certainly and in, in everything else in the Bible for that matter, didn't come with chapters and verses. Right? It's, it's it didn't come with it really didn't come with any kind of punctuation. Okay, so so that's the end of chapter chapter twelve, First Corinthians. Anybody know what what happens next? Thirteenth chapter, First Corinthians. Sure. Yeah. yeah right. Love. I mean, we, re- we read it at weddings all the time, and, and it's good to read at weddings, but, but it's got a lot more to say to us than that. Love is the still more excellent way, Paul says. If I speak in the tongue of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. In other words, love doesn't behave like the ego. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. God, I need to hear that, I'll tell you. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they'll come to an end. As for tongues, they'll they'll cease. As for knowledge, it'll come to an end. We we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now that's that's our great promise, friends, that one day we will see face to face and we will see the whole truth about ourselves, about our world, our place in it, and about God. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. The greatest of these is love. So there's Paul's image of of the body of Christ. And it's all animated by love and and what have come to be called the three great theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. That's what animates the the body. Okay, one one last thing, and then I'm gonna we'll, we'll have we'll have time, just a little bit of time for questions. I, I said a, a few minutes ago that this is really Paul's understanding of this corporate vision of of humanity is that we are invited to participate in it. Our participation is what back, back to <clears throat> back to Doyd. Our participation in this is what's going to make us human. Is what. It's, not make us human, we're already human. It's going to mark us as human. 
And so participating in this great body is how we, we're gonna distinguish ourselves from the, the, the robots and the, and the, the chat bots. It's participation in this, in this great body of Christ. So um, this participation uh, is, we often think of it as, as the communion of saints. And you know, the communion of saints is, it, that's, Paul's not talking about heaven. Paul's talking about something that's right here, right now. I mean, if you've read any of Paul's letters at all, you see he often addresses them to the saints in Corinth or the saints in, in uh, uh, Ephesus. He's talking about us. We're the saints. We are the communion of saints. Um, and so Paul addresses the, his letters to these saints um, saying, you're here, you're participating. And I, I, here's something else I love. I heard somebody say not too long ago. You know, we often say, I go to church and I live in the world. But Paul invites us to say to ourselves instead, I live in the church and I go to the world. Right? You know, we all, and, and sort of another version of that, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you know, we, we often think of ourselves as human beings on a spiritual journey. Paul would say we're spiritual beings on a human journey, right? Um, <clears throat> so it's in, it's in this, this participation in this community that um, we, we recognize that, that Christ in others. We, if we, when we know the Christ in ourselves, we can see uh, the Christ in others. Um, <clears throat> I love, I love St. Patrick's breastplate. You, you know that, you know that great hymn. Yeah, you do. Christ be with me, Christ within me. Christ behind me, Christ before me. Christ beside me, Christ to win me. Christ to comfort and restore me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ in quiet, Christ in danger. Christ in hearts of all that love me. Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Paul could have written that. Right? That's what it means to, to, when we participate in this great corporate body, this body of Christ, that's when we, we know that, that risen Christ that's, that's living right here. Well, I got a lot more to say, but I don't have any time to say it. So, so I, I hope this has been uh, useful in some way to you. Um, <clears throat> we've got just a minute or two. Uh, I'd like to uh, open the floor for any questions or comments or, you know, I, you want to throw a couple of tomatoes, I'll, I can take that too. Anybody got a, got a question or a thought you'd like to share? <clears throat>